Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, depending on where you are, where you're listening uh, from. Uh, we're on uh, day four of our uh, week-long seminar. This is the third annual uh, Georgie Dennis uh, seminar in uh, uh, security and diplomacy in the Eastern Mediterranean. And uh, although we have like this uh, this overwhelming theme of like in in maybe uh, insurgent in quotations, uh, nationalism and how that uh, deals with the dynamic Eastern Mediterranean. We sort of like started out by framing it on Monday and then on uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, we delved into more um, areas in, 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 the in the Eastern Mediterranean, saw how this, you know, what's the latest take of the latest snapshot. So uh, on uh, Tuesday, we we went through the the whole idea of like you know uh, Cyprus and Turkey and saw that interaction and uh, had uh, some thought provoking <laughs> presentations uh, yesterday on uh, some of these issues, uh, including you know a presentation on 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 Libya yesterday afternoon and and in the morning yesterday we we looked at the interaction of um, of NATO and the EU and the and the region of the Eastern Mediterranean and how those things. Uh, really uh, play off against one another. Um, and, you know, a very uh, informative uh, panel on uh, the Western Balkans yesterday led by uh, Ambassador uh, uh, Garcevic. Uh, and today, we, you know, we're happy to uh, bring back uh, somebody who, who's been with, uh, with the seminars, uh, I think, all three years that we've ran it. Uh, you know, I, I would say a, a colleague and, and, and a friend, although we have only e-met as he, he says, we haven't uh, uh, shared, uh, you know, uh, any uh, kind of a mini coffee or tea together, and hopefully that will happen in the future. Uh, so, uh, Amb uh, Ambassador uh, Rama Viram, but I'll pass it all over to uh, uh, Peter uh, Bertolotti, who is a, uh, a student at Emmanuel, an intern at the Institute, and a, a great, great contributor to the work that we've done over the last couple of years. So, Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Vermakas. Um, today, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Ambassador Ivaran. He is the lead of the consultant of BIT Consultancy, a multidisciplinary consultancy agency active in the sphere of cross boundary water interactions. His experience is based over 25 years of multilateral and bilateral diplomacy while serving in a high ranking position at Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, including Chief of Staff at Mount Perez. Ambassador to Greece, and long-term service periods in Europe and Asia, and more than six years of private and sector and academic activities on cross-boundary water interactions. He is the participant in numerous international forums and multilateral negotiations on the environment of water. A chief staff of 2000, 2000, 2003, he took a part in the bilateral negotiations with Arab neighborhood countries, including on water issues. While joining the private sector, he established a BIT consultancy, which specialized in providing service for cross-boundary water projects. BIT is the geopolitical consultant for the re rehabilitation of the Lower Jordan River project. He is the lecturer of Haifa University, and he is the founding member of the Israeli Desalination Association and member of the Board of Waterfronts Israel Water Industry Association. Before turning the microphone to him, um, I, I wanted to let everybody know that by the end we'll be doing Q&A, so use the raise hand features or send the questions direct to us and we'll ask him. Thank you. You have the floor, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I know that uh, waking up at eight o'clock to hear something very heavy would be a great burden on you. And uh, when it comes to water issues, uh, since you washed your face already, this time I will move away from dealing with uh, primarily water and environmental issues, which I did uh, in the last uh, uh, three meetings of uh, uh, Emmanuel uh, College uh, seminars, and I will try to give a, a little bit more of uh, a, an overall uh, view of how I see things developing in the East Mediterranean from a very, uh, I would say, narrow, though fundamental view, and that is the um, relations uh, between uh, interest and values. So, uh, let me uh, uh, share my screen with you. And no, I'm not going to play chess with you. I'm going to show you this few seconds. Now, uh, guys, this is more like, a, 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 how shall I say, 
uh, giving you a, a bit of a teaser for our discussion more than anything else. And uh, that is why it's gonna be uh, more of an impressionist uh, point of view than something which is uh, very academic in what it is. But uh, I realize following the uh, recent uh, developments in Israel since uh, this uh, new government of Israel uh, came to power that uh, guys, we have a problem because there are very many problems of uh, interest and the uh, values around the uh, uh, around the globe and certainly in uh, in our region but uh, somehow things became more urgent for me as an Israeli to look into and I, I will start by saying that uh, I do think that there is a bit of a problem in between values and interests maybe it will all be familiar to you uh, even if uh, the list of uh, what uh, we put under democratic values like human rights equality for all free election system functioning democratic institute crimes against humanity environmental protection weapons proliferation free press treatment of asylum seekers strong and independent judicial system and protection of a uh, population against uh, genocide. This might be, uh, a, 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 how shall I put it, uh, a pretty obvious to all of us that this should be the fundamentals of life and of public uh, sphere and of uh, the statehood in which we are living in. However, uh, we have learned throughout uh, uh, history that uh, what we take uh, is uh, an obvious and taken for granted cannot be taken for granted so easily. However, on the interest side, again, um, it's a power and global influence. Uh, what is more obvious than looking at the, the Ukraine uh, war in order to understand that this is not uh, a small little tiny issue between uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine over a piece of land. Uh, by the way, when it was a little bit like that, at the, the Krema uh, crisis, uh, then somehow the world was um, not so much in the, in the business. And, but in, since uh, uh, February last year, then the world realized that we are talking about much more than that. And, Certainly, certainly so uh, the case with the, the US because in many ways, I'm going to focus a little bit on US a, a foreign policy and US diplomacy because I believe that even though there are challenges over the hegemony of the US as it, we used to see it uh, since the end of the Cold War by China, by Russia, etc. Still, for us on the uh, Western globe, uh, the US foreign policy is uh, of major importance, first of all, because it is still strong enough in order to change the balance of power. And we see it in Ukraine, and there's no question that when it comes to Israel, without support of the US, things would be much, much more complicated. And by the way, there are a few in Israel that uh, tend to forget it from time to time and we have to put them in place in order to do that. But so the US, we are looking at, at it as a source of power, of course, but we also look at it at a source of values because we say, ah, the US, is this is what we are looking for. So when we are looking at interest, and especially when you look at it from the point of view of uh, the US, then you say, okay, let's give a few examples. Uh, one is the global influence. The second is uh, energy. And though the US is self-sufficient in terms of uh, uh, carbon uh, uh, fuels, then still uh, energy is a, a major issue and let alone economic factors of all kinds uh, from markets to others. So 
this is what we would like to look at. at the, the one side is the democratic values and on the other side, our interest. And one would say right away, hey, this is not necessarily too contradictory side. Uh, okay, this is uh, something that we will have to look. Uh, following the, uh, the nice uh, events uh, recently on the chat uh, GPT, I did an exercise and gave chat GPT uh, to say a few words on what he feels about values and interest. And not that I'm interested in what uh, 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 this a, a, a chat can answer, but I believe that in many ways it reflects the, um, I would say, the common way of thinking that you can find on the web. So it reflects some common knowledge that, that are not necessarily uh, so uh, uh, deep in what they say. So what they say that the US foreign policy is a complex or <laughs> they are telling us, and the multifaceted issues that involves balancing American values and interests. So in a minute, we will ask ourselves when he says American values, what is it behind? And I'm talking to you saying, guys, not that I put a doubt on what American values are all about, but maybe we should at least look deeper into it. And he kept on saying something uh, like, uh, however, these values can sometimes come into conflict with US strategic interest, such as an economic and security concern. And the word balancing values with interest do not give us a real answer of how these two are playing a role. And it has in it as if it is a legitimate thing that you have a contradictory between value and interest. Now, let me be a little bit uh, provocative, which I hope uh, I will be even more than that, but I will start with Mr. Trump. You had a president that in the second round, 70 million Americans uh, vote for. And I don't have to put all the 30,000 uh, uh, different uh, 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 lies and uh, et cetera that uh, the New York Times uh, counted in his speeches, but the concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make US manufacturing non-competitive. So a president, American values. So the word, the general, the generality, American values is to be checked. Is the 6th of January last year part of the American value? And you will say right away, Ram, how dare you? a small minority, not uh, 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 this is not America and we are handling it. And you see what happened during this uh, um, year and a half in the, in, the, uh, in the Congress and the investigation and the announcement of uh, the uh, special prosecutor that he is about uh, to put uh, a few dozens of people with uh, some surprises uh, um, in court for what has happened. But remember guys, that these pictures of course has been seen all over the world. And the obvious term American values at least was challenged. We are still on the uh, 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 Republican side of course, but uh, uh, Colin Powell, the late Colin Powell, whom I met a few times and I, I was thinking very highly of him. And the story says that uh, when he entered the State Department back in 2001 and under George W. Bush, he uh, 
summoned uh, the different uh, heads of uh, department to a close meeting. And uh, among them was those who are in charge on promoting uh, democracy around the world. And uh, others which were dealing with the environmental issues. And uh, the guys uh, started, uh, you know, briefing the new secretary of state of what are we doing in our department? And they say we are promoting uh, democracy and democratic values and we are pushing here and we are giving uh, um, more attention to NGOs and we assist them here and we uh, devote money to have uh, seminars for them. And Colin Powell looked at them and said, guys, are you sure that this is our interest to promote democratic values? And a whole discussion erupted there. But the people participated in this meeting that a few of them I met later on were somewhat taken back by a question mark over something that uh, in American years was obvious. What else did we do in Vietnam if not having democratic values? And here we go to the democratic side. The very, very famous June 4th, 2009, Obama in Cairo. And President Obama said, I've come here to Cairo to seek a new beginning between the United States and Muslims. And he keep on saying we have mutual interest. Those interests are overlap and share common principles, principles of justice, progress, tolerance, and dignity of all human beings. And you would say, we were all clapping hands. Here comes a president that put values like that and looking for the promotion. Of course, the package is different in the sense that this was uh, a, a way to uh, try and uh, mend fences with the Muslim world after uh, two wars in Iraq, etc., in Afghanistan, of course, etc. But he came all the way to say that principles of justice and progress and tolerance are between us. And there was a very, very uh, a serious effort on the side of the Americans uh, to promote uh, those values. And here comes the Arab Spring that for most of you, I don't have to elaborate on. And it ended up in very many catastrophes. Syria, Egypt, you name it. So this should be bear in mind as well that American values and values in other parts of the world may not be the same and may be applied in a very different way. But at least we try, Obama's people will say. We gave it a try and the people in the streets of uh, Cairo, of uh, Damascus, those who remain uh, alive in Damascus, uh, understood now that they have uh, a voice and this voice should be heard, something that we did not have before. So let me return now when we understand that the uh, American values not necessarily ends up the way we want to prioritizing and look what chat GPT again is saying. On the one hand, there are countries in the region and I'm talking about now I'm getting into the East Mediterranean that prioritize values such as democracy, human rights, and rule of law. These countries often align with the United States and Europe and seek 
to promote these values across the region. Huh. Sounds nice, ain't it? On the other hand, this uh, chat GPT, the Microsoft Oracle says, on the other hand, there are countries that prioritize their own national interest, including economic security and strategic interest. These countries often align with Russia and China and seek to maintain their dominance and influence in the region. Okay, I am not in the uh, business of uh, looking at what the uh, GPT has to say if it's correct or incorrect, but I think that it reflects a bit superficial uh, a view which says we on the American European side we are looking for human rights, for rule of the law. The others, those with Russia and China, all their interest is to have dominance. Mm. Is this the case? So let's dive a little bit deeper and look into countries with faulty democratic values in the region. A very simple one. I put Iran aside because it is not part of this Mediterranean, of course, it, it is presence there and whatever Iran is the extreme, extreme uh, example of non-democratic value. But if you look at the rest of the East Mediterranean, with the exception of my country of residence now, which is Greece and, and Cyprus, of course, in all of them, there are problems of faulty democratic values. Without an exception, I don't have you have dealt with Turkey, you know what Erdogan and the people around him with, concerning the coming elections are all about. Egypt, the Kingdom of Jordan, MBS in Saudi Arabia, Iraq, the a, a Palestinian Authority with its a, a ruthless, a, at times, a methods, poor Lebanon, and now even Israel, in very many ways. And I'm not referring on law. I, I don't want to, to uh, do a, a, a preamble for your uh, conversation later on today on the developments in Israel, but I would say don't think only on the issues that has to do with the judicial system that you see in the last few days. Think that uh, those people in power now have given up any kind of way that would give the Palestinians their national rights. And they are doing their utmost, including today morning, when part of the, uh, at least what seemed to be a um, part of uh, uh, international law that it is only the uh, army that is dealing with the occupation uh, of uh, uh, an area. They have moved a part of the uh, um, civil, uh, um, of the civil administration into civilian hands. So guys, look at that. That's what East Med is all about all red dots. Let's give only one example. If we are looking at the religion that is coming close to more autocratic into more, uh, I would say, divine rule in the sense that there is, uh, is somebody there that is uh, bringing along with him a conservatism in most cases. And Apparently, it's the same map. And we should ask ourselves, where is the uh, more liberal religious people? Where, is the, where are more religious people? Can they be liberal? And the amazing thing is it is exactly the same countries where religion 
and the politics of religion are playing major role. Very much so. Actually, in most of those countries, you cannot even think of dividing the, uh, uh, the power from the religious people. And you would say, okay, let's try and divide in between those that are, that have always been, and those that in recent years have moved more into the uh, red part. And if you look at Turkey and the loss of uh, human rights and anti-media as it was in the last few years, which was never before that harsh, uh, you are looking at uh, Israel. You are looking at Saudi Arabia with the behavior of MBS towards media. You look at Egypt under a Sisi. All those countries, not only they are, that they are, a, a, I wouldn't say far, but at least a, a, their democracies are in question mark in, in many ways, a, that the recent years has been even more so. So then one would ask yourself in which of those countries US have a major interest because we said, okay, values is one thing and interest is another thing. And we find out that it is, if I took, if I take Iran and to a lesser extent, uh, Syria and Lebanon with all its uh, complications, but I'm looking at all other countries. They are very much in the very center of US interest and where US is investing in keeping them, in cooperating with them, Saudi Arabia and UAI, uh, UAE and Egypt. And to a certain extent, yes, a little bit bumpy with uh, a few uh, uh, question marks and no F-35, no, it's there. But Turkey is being supported uh, as a member of NATO. And certainly, when you have to pull it back away from Russia, let alone cooperation with Iran. So suddenly the map of interest and the map of values is at least make us think twice. We have to admit that in very many cases, it is choosing between bad and the worst. I don't know what we prefer, Assad or ISIS. You would say, okay, let's have double containment. <laughs> we don't want this and we don't want that. But at least we have to admit that there, is, that there isn't very much of another choice between them. So the US find itself supporting the Kurds as the minority there. But this is a harsh decision to take. If we look at Turkey, were we ever very satisfied with the control of the army over the democracy? I remember the Europeans uh, put a, a, a huge question mark on the possibility of Turkey joining the EU because of the ability of the uh, army to control the democratic. And if we are looking at uh, Egypt in between the Muslim brothers and the, the late uh, Mursi and Assisi, this is also a difficult choice. So you would say, eh, don't be too harsh on the US because the, it's a choice between the bad and the worst and you can decide which one is better for you. But still the issue of values is in question mark. And I want to say in a very clear way, I don't think it's only Republican. We saw it recently. If you look at the Mr. Biden, President Biden standing there in one line with Assisi, 
and with the king of uh, Jordan and uh, with the Saudi crown prince and none of them represent American values the way we would have liked to think of. So did the US make their choice? Have the values been lost? Thank you very much. I will now stop sharing and- Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ram. Uh, as, as always, uh, not only, uh, you know, full of content and information, but uh, very thought provoking um, uh, indeed. Uh, we we have the ambassador with us for another uh, twenty five minutes because he has to leave right on the on the dot. So you know, I I ask people to you know uh, formulate their questions, and so for a, a, a discourse, um, we had uh, Professor Charujas yesterday morning on you know who uh, spoke of um, the EU and it's sort of like an absence from the region in in recent uh, years. Uh, uh, Raise the question that you're raising in your presentation in somewhat, you know, uh, was it at any time about democracy? Was it any time about democratic values? But has it always been about uh, interest uh, shielded with uh, democratic values, more of the, you know, so I, I said to him at the time, you know, because it was towards the end, I said, this is a, a bigger question. And you and I hadn't talked about this, but, you know, you, you raised the question very uh, aptly this morning. And I, you know, I, I would raise the question to you. And you know, is, do do you think this is just the latest phase uh, of what we're seeing, or are we seeing something that we have seen repeatedly? Uh, that how can a a country like the United States, with the interests of the United States, the global interest, um, you know, uh, how much of a folly would it be? Almost like you know that uh, uh, Colin Powell uh, story that uh, you uh, shared with us. I would say that uh, choosing between the bad and the worst is uh, right for the US as well. <laughs> because uh, there are countries where it's obvious that uh, uh, none of these values that we are talking about as values huh, uh, uh, is, I mean, if I have to choose between, uh, let's say, uh, Russia and, uh, and the US as uh, um, an exemplary uh, state or regime that I would like to follow, I have no doubt which one I would choose. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that uh, the US uh, throughout the years, and especially during the Cold War, if we are looking at the, after the Second World War, uh, really presented in very many ways uh, uh, more um, I would say a, a tendency to show freedom and the uh, and, uh, but uh, we cannot ignore that, uh, especially when it comes to East Mediterranean and the Middle East, the interest, especially when we were all so very much uh, dependent on uh, carbon fuels, interest played uh, much more important role than any values. And as I say, when Obama came and tried to put the values ahead of the interest, American pivot players in the, in the East Mediterranean found themselves uh, in big question mark. Big question mark. Uh, You know, from Israel's point of view, uh, we are always looking at America to protect us also in terms of values. We say, ah, the Americans will not do that. And as long, of course, the, the situation of Israel is very complicated and you cannot say it's, uh, it's uh, non-democratic, but when it comes to the Palestinians, Besides the brave uh, effort by Clinton, I do not see any serious effort to bring Israel into the table. 
serious risk. And even now, America is saying, uh, okay, uh, uh, Mr. Netanyahu, be, you and your allies in your coalition, be careful in what you do with the Palestinians, but it's, it ends there. Yeah. Well, I, I think one factor that we don't necessarily take into account a lot of times, and you know, I, I find myself in these conversations, especially when I'm on this side of the Atlantic as opposed to that side of the Atlantic, is that for a lot of people, you know, for a lot of you know uh, Europeans and out, you know, on that side of the world, looking at the United States as a monolithic actor really limits the you know the sophistication of how U.S. foreign policy is created namely the, the pressures that exist inside. So you have like this, this politicians that find themselves in the middle as far as lobbying is concerned, is a, as far as even political expediency. I mean, we're, right now, we, we know we're seeing an American president right now vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine, for instance, and a lot of those decisions and pronouncements and even the optics of the last week um, have to do in part with what's going on, the election that's coming up in 2024. Mm. Right. So there, there's a lot of like that that push that, you know, and I think when it comes to Israel, uh, the United States is really has a, a difficult, difficult time because it's sort of like it has this anti-Semitic reflexes and it tries to hide the anti-Semitic reflexes. And so they we don't have a sophisticated conversation when it comes to Israel as a society. And then you find politicians being trapped. It's the same kind of an issue when it comes to like something like Cuba, for instance, or other areas where they become sort of like, you know, measuring sticks for getting that state versus that other state. So uh, I think that's a dimension that we don't necessarily see in our in our uh, foreign policy pronouncements and looking at the United States in a uh, somewhat one-dimensional actor. I mean, what's, what's your thought on that? One, I, I wouldn't claim to understand the, the internal mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure it's very correct. Uh, that uh, there are very many factors that actually um, are there. I mean, I'm uh, a student of international relations and uh, this uh, wonderful uh, um, um, article about the, the uh, missile crisis with Cuba, uh, with the three dimensions of uh, how the decision was actually taken by Kennedy at the end, is is a fantastic one. So uh, we, I'm, I'm I'm sure that the mechanism there is is of major importance. But uh, at the end of the day, there is a policy of uh, there is a policy of a certain administration. And this policy is the one that is seen. You can, you can say, okay, I can justify it with, I can explain it with, but at the end of the day, you have a policy. A policy says, for example, we will not let Israel being embarrassed by a decision of the Security Council when it comes to the occupied territories. And Various administrations for different parties did not put a veto whenever it comes to the Security Council. Now, I'm sure that behind it, there is a, a, a big mechanism of a, a lobby. There is a, an understanding of a, the very complex issue of the Middle East and why it is important to take a, the most important ally in terms of stability, at least until now, uh, for the US and protect it in very many ways. Uh, and really a deep understanding of the different presidents on the uh, uh, complex issue. But at the end of the day, this is the American policy. And the, the Europeans, other uh, members of the Security Council, not that they are you know, righteous among nations. Um, I, uh, please don't misunderstand me that I'm um, a critic here and uh, I'm embracing the other. This is not the case, mm -hmm. <laughs> very well aware. But I, at the same time, I cannot ignore when there is uh, a, a growing gap between, and of course, at the time of, uh, uh, at the time of Trump, it was even more vivid. Guys, don't... Uh, don't expect us. Our American value 
is not what you think American values are all about. There is a, an internal American complex. I, I absolutely uh, accept it, but I, I say, remember Petros, that at the end, there is a policy. Yeah. There is an ambassador at the UN who is getting, who has to raise his hand. Yes, no. Yeah, no, I, I have a follow up, but I, I, I would do want to find out if there are any other questions even from Peter or Isaac uh, or from our, our attendees, uh, if there are any questions, but I do have a follow up to that. Okay. Anybody? Uh, you guys have a... No questions on my end. I'm not seeing any in the chat either. Okay, so my, my, my follow up then is, you know, um, then maybe Trump was the the most articulate in, in putting American values forth those American values. So like, you know, I'm very surprised that um, the Abraham Accords, for instance, that is a sort of like at the tail end of the Trump administration. Uh, uh, it's not only, you know, not stalled, but it's embraced and it's actually viewed as sort of like a, a positive step by American policymakers. Yeah. Uh, he is a person who sort of like threw the cards up and said, you know, this, let's make a deal. Uh, and you know, however he did it, made a deal, and maybe that's that's a clear indication of uh, of American interests or uh, values. Ah, <laughs> there we are, Petros. Mm. Values or, or interest. Yeah. Uh, I I don't doubt that. Uh, even though, to to my mind, uh, look, I'm a, a veteran of the '90s. I was uh, traveling uh, when it was still not a very popular thing to Oman every three months between 96 and 2000 to put uh, the, uh, and to establish together with the American friends of mine, uh, the Middle East Desalination Research Center. And I could see how that was fading out in no time. I'm very happy of what we see now with the United Arab Emirates with the Sudan coming closer with the uh, with Saudi Arabia over there waiting for the right opportunity to jump on the carriage. I'm 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 very happy with this. Don't don't misunderstand me. But at least we have to be uh, sort of uh, uh, true with ourselves that it is not that suddenly we see uh, common values. We see only common interest. Good. Um, I do have a, a question. Um, you did mention about the United States and the in countries that he has interested in, but at the same time, we see that there's a lack of democratic values in these countries. Um, so following up to that, um, how can in countries that have a, at least a speech of showing a great emphasis to democratic values work with these countries that they have interested in but also try to work out the differences when they don't have give emphasis to democratic values. So how should be the approach that you see that should be taken? Um, you know, I think that in a certain way, what uh, Petro said is uh, very correct because uh, at least when it, come, when it came to Trump, he said, guys, don't, don't play uh, as if you are uh, uh, looking for democratic values. We have a very precise, well-defined uh, interest. And we do not care whatsoever what values you have in mind. This is not the way we should conduct ourselves. And this is what we are going to do. Uh, and that is why uh, in a certain way, he managed with the, uh, the Saudis and the Emirates say uh, maybe better than others. Because he said, guys, I'm not playing games with you. I'm not uh, trying to say that uh, you killed this journalist or you did not kill. I believe you that you did not kill. And maybe he was more efficient, but 
Uh, then the next question would be, what is the, uh, what is important for, uh, uh, for the long run? What will be more sustainable? And uh, I'm a great believer that uh, democratic values are much more sustainable than an Assad regime. But I was mistaken. I am a believer in that, but uh, I have a, a few good Greek professors here that reminds me all the time that uh, in 2011, I said, okay, it may take two years, three years, because the Alawites are more than Mubarak in the sense of uh, being a million people and they have more to lose and etc. So they will fight to the end. And here we are, 2023, Assad is there, not what he used to be, but he's there. No, no, is he there? I mean, we sort of like, you know, we wish had like a my, uh, an Assad in Libya or, or, you know, I mean, you have like this sort of like this vacuous spaces that we're happy with the status quo in this vacuous spaces. Like, you know, uh, 20 years ago, you might've said like, you know, Cyprus was the last one of those, you know, uh, question marks as far as you know the status quo or Israel. Today you have a number of cases where you know the status quo might be just uh, leave it as is, and uh, you know the resources are still coming out of Libya. Uh, there's not a problem there. Uh, Russia and, and 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 Turkey have some kind of an accommodation in in Syria minus the earthquake. So it's almost like you know we we have like settled in. Uh, to this, um, to <laughs> this structure. You, you know, uh, uh, that's exactly what it is. It sounds so cold. Yeah. Mm. Maybe it reflects the New England weather right now, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. But it's like you know, it's, you, so we like to the, the the summer program that we do looks at you know we started in 2011, 2012, and the idea was like you know we teach a course on the geopolitics of energy and democracy. Uh, and uh, that was the, that, that whole balancing act because you see these two forces coming out of the 1990s, right? And you get all this, uh, all this academic discourse on uh, universalizing democracy, making universally spreading democracy. And at the same time, you've seen this tremendous drive for energy now that the Caspian Sea has been unleashed to the world out of the clutches of the Soviet Union. Uh, and, mm -hmm. you know, for the last 25 years, there's two forces that are sort of like going at each other. And I think your your presentation this morning just really taps onto that and like actually, you know, point out that like, you know, whether it's a Republican or a Democrat, it doesn't necessarily matter. The, the rhetoric is democratic. The practice is interest, right? So it's just sort of like have this, this layering. If, and if I manage to put that in a, a visual way, <laughs> I'm happy. <laughs> I think you did. And I think, you know, you, you did. I think I was very intrigued by the fact that you use uh, chat GPT as well to do it, which I think is, uh, it really speaks to your innovative uh, capacities and the fact that, you know, we have been talking about how we sort of like, you know, uh, react to this, you know, like, you know, let's put a shield up. We don't want any change like Luddites. You've done exactly, yes, yes, the, opposite. Yes. I, I heard exactly about, the opposite. You embraced. I, I heard about dissertation and the, and the, <laughs> The other way around, take yeah. from it what it can. Yeah, yeah, no, but and I, I, the other thing that I was intrigued about, you know, I know we have like just a few minutes with you, um, the the red dots that you have there, I thought that was really interesting, and the the the, the what you did with the the religion part, and it like it, it's you know it's something that you'd probably know better than anybody because you like you know, you're a, a diplomat, uh, you know, I mean that was the almost a dividing line that Metternich had about Europe to begin with in 1815, as far as the how we define ourselves, continue to define ourselves on religion religious basis first and not on secular basis. So I think that's that's very telling that, you know, that part of the world, we still, I mean, I still have a hard time as a, a Greek to say, well, there's a Greek Buddhist, you know, that, that kind of a thing, that kind of a concept. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of they a, look at you as if you fall from the bone, huh? <laughs> that's right. Like, you know, we can't separate that, that the uh, ethnic from the religious. And I think that that was very interesting that you uh, overlapped that. By the way, I, I, I added the, these dots because it fitted <laughs> my, <laughs> my, my way of thinking. <laughs> so, anyway, and great fun. Yeah. Uh,